Jaw movement characteristics differ from one individual to another and thus provide a very interesting subject for scientific study. This motion picture presents a new method of measuring and recording these movements by engraving them in clear resin blocks. The recording is performed with a specially designed experimental pantograph, which culminated six years of research effort. In order to attach the device to the patient's jaws, a set of custom-made plastic clutches are used. The recording pantograph consists of two face poses. One is fixed to the upper jaw, and the other is fixed to the lower jaw to move with the mandible. The upper bow is a rigid, lightweight metal structure, which holds three clear polyester resin recording blocks in fixed spatial relationships to each other, and to the orbital axis plane of the patient's head. Two of the recording blocks cover the region of hinge axis movements, and the third is centered in front of the face. A pointer located on the right side of the bow orients the recordings to the orbital axis plane of reference. The lower face bow is also a rigid, lightweight metal structure. It supports three recording drills, which are driven by high-speed air turbines. Two of the drills are horizontally aligned on a common axis with their tips located precisely at a standardized distance of 220 millimeters apart for recording the movement of the hinge axis of the mandible. These two drills, in combination with the anterior drill, form a recording tripod. The clutches are cemented over the subject's teeth with a zinc oxide and eugenol impression paste. A U-shaped frame is attached to the maxillary clutch to hold the upper recording bow. Note the two attachment cups on the frame. A similar U-shaped frame is joined to the mandibular clutch to attach the lower recording bow. The two cups on the upper frame are filled with quick setting plaster in preparation for attaching the upper bow to the maxilla. This is accomplished by inserting the ends of two vertical rods of the bow into the soft plaster. While the plaster is setting, the points of the two alignment pins are held to the axis spots which have been previously located and marked by conventional methods. This procedure not only centers the bow on the patient's head, but also orients it so that the axis of the two alignment pins is collinear with the hinge axis of the mandible in centric relation. The two alignment pins are removed from the alignment blocks, and the subject is placed in a supine position. The mandibular bow is lowered over the attachment frame, so that the ends of the frame protrude freely through the attachment tubes. The lateral recording drills, which have a common axis, are inserted into the holes previously occupied by the alignment pins of the upper bow. Plaster is placed in the tubes to attach the bow solidly to the mandible. The mandible is retruded several times and finally held in centric relation while the plaster sets. The hinge axis of the mandible has now been made collinear to the axis of the recording drills. The drills are retracted from the alignment blocks, thus leaving the lower bow supported totally by the mandible. The mandible is retruded and the drills reinserted to check the accuracy of the axis mounting. The drills are again retracted so that the alignment blocks may be removed and replaced with recording blanks.
A clear plastic shield is placed over the patient's face to protect him from the resin particles generated by the drills. The subject is rehearsed in the various movements to be recorded. With the mandible and centric relation, the anterior drill is activated and inserted into its recording block. It is locked at a depth indicated by a scale on the side of the turbine carriage. The left lateral border movement is recorded with the drill engraving a three-dimensional pathway. The mandible is recruited to centric relation. Drill reinserted into the recording lock the same depth as before. The right lateral recording is accomplished by having the subject move his mandible slowly to the right while the drill cuts the pathway. The mandible is returned to centric relation. And the recording of the protrusive movement is made in a similar manner. The left lateral recording is verified by repeating the border movement to the left. And then to the right. These repeat movements are done to make sure that the mandible was tracing a true border movement. The protrusive recording is verified by repeating the movement. The mandible is again placed in centric relation in preparation for recording the movements of the hinge axis. With the mandible in centric relation, the two axis drills are made to penetrate their associated recording blocks of predetermined depth, as indicated by calibrations on the turbine carriage. The turbine carriages are locked when the drill tips are precisely at the standardized distance of 220 millimeters apart. The left lateral movement is shown being recorded on the right side of the patient. While the right side drill is recording the left lateral movement as shown here, the left side drill, which cannot be seen, is recording the same movement in a reverse direction. The mandible is returned to centric relation with the drills inactive. The right lateral movement is now recorded and appears on the working side as a backlash. The mandible is returned to centric relation with the drills inactive. The axis record blocks are switched from right to left so that the blank sides may be used for recording the protrusive movement. The mandible is retruded to centric relation. And the axis recording drills are made to penetrate the new sides of the record blocks. They are locked at the same depth as they were for the recording of the lateral jaw movements. The same two points 220 millimeters apart on the hinge axis which were previously traced in the lateral jaw movements are traced in the protrusive movement. The mandible is returned to centric relation with the recording drills inactivated. The anterior reference pointer is adjusted and secured to the orbital spot on the right side of the nose.
Note that the orbital spot has been marked temporarily with dark ink for photographic clarity. The recording equipment is removed from a patient by loosening the attachment clamps. Here in these resin blocks are recorded in three dimensions the right and left lateral and protrusive movements of this patient's mandible. Part two of this motion picture will show how the information stored in these three blocks is reconverted by a secondary phonograph to locations near the condyles. This procedure produces a pair of motion analogs which will serve to guide and control the movements of an articulator for simulating this patient's characteristic jaw movements. Shown here is a full view of the reconverter, which is a second pantograph used to generate analog guides for an articulator. The T-shaped upper frame is removed and compared to the maxillary counterpart of the patient recording pantograph. Note that the three recording blocks have been removed from the maxillary bow and transferred directly to the T-frame, which holds them in the same relationship. The mandibular bow of the patient recorder is compared to the counterpart of the reconverter to show the smooth steel guide pins which substitute for the recording drills. The frames of the reconverter are locked together in centric relation by utilizing the centric position of the protrusive recordings. The guide pins are retracted from the recordings and the upper frame is lifted on its pivoting post so that the analog blocks can be secured in position. Both the clear recording and the blue analog blocks are made of polyester resin so that the heat generated by the drills will not melt or distort them during the pantographing procedures. The analog blocks are lowered slowly over the hemispherical end of analog mills to form centric openings. The frame is guided precisely downward to centric by a series of four vertical posts, one of which can be seen to the right of the blue block. After the centric openings have been generated, the guide pins are reinserted and locked into the centric portion of the protrusive recordings. The four vertical posts which ensure the precise centric openings in the blocks are raised and locked out of position so that the patient's recordings can guide the movements of the T-frame for generating the analogs. The one-quarter inch vertical mills are activated with a foot control and the frame is moved distally while being guided by the protrusive recordings. Shown here is a close view of the protrusive movement being pantographed on the axis near the condyle level. The actual intercondylar distance of the patient is of no significance with this system. However, the location of these vertical analog mills is at the average anatomical intercondylar distance of 110 millimeters, which makes a convenient size articulator for practical laboratory work. In this view, we see the entire upper frame being guided by the three recording blocks. This close view shows the anterior block guiding the frame in the protrusive motion. We now inspect the completed protrusive movement analogs. The pointer is indicating that the patient's recording blocks have now been reversed to expose the lateral border recordings to the guide pins. The analogs are repositioned over the vertical mills in centric relation, and the guide pins are inserted into the lateral border recordings. 
The mills are activated and the border movements are pantographed. Here we see the right recording with an analog being generated on the left. Note the backlash effect in the recording was caused by the pivotal action of the working condyle. Observe that the Bennett and opening pads are magnifications of the movements at the condyle level. A closer view of the recording shows the backlash effect, the lateral and medial Bennett shift, and the Bennett and orbiting paths. On the left, starting in centric, we see the lateral and medial Bennett shift of the working condyle, followed by the curvilinear Bennett and orbiting movements. A closer view of the guide pin shows the lateral Bennett shift and backlash, the medial Bennett shift, and the Bennett and orbiting paths. This view shows the anterior recording of the lateral border movements. Note the twisting motion of the frame as it rotates and translates in the three planes of space. After the border movements have been generated in the analogs, the guide pins are retracted and the analogs examined at close range. In the right analog, we see outlined the border movements including the Bennett, orbiting, and protrusive paths. Here we see the same movements on the left. This view shows that the combinator elements of the articulator and centric indicating key are spaced exactly like their counterparts on the reconverter. The analogs are removed and attached directly to the maxillary frame of the articulator for replay. Observe the right condylar element as it moves from centric to protrusion and back to centric. Outward and inward Bennett ship, inward on the Bennett, and orbiting paths. In the right working path, the balancing Bennett and orbiting paths, and back to centric. The centric pin is depressed to position the condylar elements in centric relations. 